us now. Why has this calamity come upon us? What work do you do? Where are you from? What is your country? Which is your people? Okay, I want to look up and something. I want to look up something here. What is your malach taka? Your uh, what is your job? Your occupation, your work, yeah. your industry. This is the same word as malach, which is the word for angel. Hmm. That's the exact same Hebrew word, except for is not the spiritual angels in the heavenlies not god's servants but these are are servants of men right and what is your occupation who's hired you Who, what do you do you know mm -hmm. and where have you come from and what is your country what are the people what people are you from from what race what nation Okay, let me get back over here. I'm going to close out some of these that are uh, unnecessary. Next one over. Next tab. Okay, let's see where we are. There's two interlinears of this one. I'm going to close it. And now we're down to two Bibles open. We can probably sort through it now. Okay, so starting in verse 9. And so Yonah answered them, I am a Hebrew, and I fear Yahweh, the God of heaven, who made both the sea and the dry land. At this, the man grew very afraid and said to him, What is this that you have done? For the men knew he was trying to get away from Yahweh since he had told them. They asked him, What should we do to you so that the sea will be calm for us? For the sea was getting rougher all the time, thus middle of a hurricane. Pick me up, he told them. Yonah told them to pick him up and throw him into the sea. Then the sea will be calm for you. Because I know it's my fault, said Yonah, that this terrible storm has come over you. Okay. Nevertheless, the man rode hard trying to reach the land. Jumps on board this ship where God did not tell him to go. And he went anyway. And so why did he go anyway? Because he didn't want to do the job that God had called him to do. Because he was enemies with Nineveh. But there are so many things here in the Hebrew text that we can't even begin to cover it. But to just show you some of the mysteries of the Hebrew is just absolutely phenomenal in this book of Jonah look at the name Nineveh you got all those yuds reaching down to the earth line all the messiahs sent down there it seems that maybe Nineveh has had multiple opportunities to be to mend their ways and to repent and do good did they do it well evidently uh, and so here's another opportunity here comes another uh, Messiah from uh, via uh, Jonah we see that Jonah and Yeshua seem to have something really in common because Messiah Yeshua came and, and reached out to the whole world through us we are able to continue reaching out to the world for him and on his behalf so here he is little dove Yona, the, 
and they threw him overboard. And of course, he the sea. <laughs> As we'll read in the next lines. Right. Up. So let's continue then. Nevertheless, the men rowed hard trying to reach the shore, but they couldn't because the sea kept growing wilder against them. Finally, they cried to Yahweh, Please, Yahweh, please, don't let us perish for causing the death of this man, and don't hold us account for shedding innocent blood, because you, Yahweh, have done what you saw fit. Then they picked up Yonah and threw him into the sea, and the sea stopped raging. Seized with great fear of Yahweh, they offered a sacrifice to Yahweh and made vows. Made vows. Hmm. Interesting, isn't it? Yahweh prepared a huge fish to swallow Yonah. And Yonah was in the belly of the fish for three days and three nights. From the belly of the fish, Yonah prayed to Yahweh his God. He said, Out of my distress I called to Yahweh, and he answered me. From the belly of Sheol I cried, What's and you Sheol? heard my voice. The grave. Right. For you threw me into the deep, into the heart of the seas, and the flood enveloped me. All the surging waves, all your surging waves passed over me. I thought I have been banished from your sight. But I will again look at your holy temple. The water surrounded me, threatened my life. The deep closed over me. Seaweed twined around my head. I was going down to the bottoms of the mountains. To a land whose bars would close me in forever. But you brought me up alive from the pit. Yahweh my God. As my life was ebbing away, I remembered Yahweh. And my prayer came into you, into your holy temple. Those who worship vain idols give up their source of mercy. But I, speaking my thanks out loud, will sacrifice to you. What I have vowed, I will pay. Salvation comes from Yahweh. Then Yahweh spoke to the fists and it vomited Yonah out under dry land. And now the word of Yahweh came to Yonah. A second time, set out for the great city of Nineveh and proclaim to it the message I will give you. So Yonah set out and went to Nineveh as Yahweh had said. Now Nineveh was such a large city that it took three days just to cross it. Yonah began his entry into the city and had finished only his first day of proclaiming. In forty days Nineveh will be overthrown when the people of Nineveh believed God. They proclaimed a fast and put on sackcloth from the greatest of them to the least. When the news reached the king of Nineveh, he got up from his throne and took off his, throne, his robe put on sackcloth and sat in ashes. Then he, he then had this proclamation made throughout Nineveh by decree of the king and his nobles. No person or animal, herd or flock, is to put anything in his mouth. They are neither to eat nor drink water. They must be covered with sackcloth, both people and animals, and they are to cry out to God with all their might. Let each of them turn from his evil way and from the violence they practice. Who knows, maybe God will change his mind, relent, and turn from his fierce anger, and then we won't perish. When God saw by their deeds that they had turned from their evil way, he relented and did not bring on them the punishment he had threatened. But this was very displeasing to Yonah, and he became angry. He prayed to Yahweh, How now, Yahweh, didn't I say this would happen? When I was still in my own country. That's why I tried to get away to Tarsus ahead of time. I knew you were a God who is merciful and compassionate. Slow to anger and rich in grace. And that you relent from afflicting punishment. Therefore Yahweh please take. Just take my life away from me. It's better for me to be dead than alive. Yahweh asked. Is it right for you to be so angry? Yonah left the city and found a place east of the city where he made himself a shelter and sat down under it, in its shade, 
to see what would happen to the city. Yahweh, God, prepared a castor bean plant and made it grow up over Yonah to shade his head and relieve his discomfort. So Yonah was delighted with the castor bean plant. But at dawn the next day, God prepared a worm which attacked the castor bean plant so that it dried up. Then when the sun rose, God prepared the scorching east wind, and the sun beat down on Yonah's head so hard that he grew faint and begged that he could die, saying, I would be better off dead than alive. God asked Yonah, Is it right for you to be so angry about the castor bean plant? He answered, Yes, it's right for me to be so angry that I could die. Yahweh said, You are concerned over the castor bean plant, which cost you no effort. You didn't make it grow. It came up in the night and perished in the night. So shouldn't I be concerned about the great city of Nineveh, in which there are more than 120,000 people who don't know their right hand from their left, not to mention all the animals? Okay. Oh. What? Not to mention all the animals. Do we want to uh, have a little discussion time over this? Because there's a lot to discuss in here if you want to do that. Sure. What are these metaphors in this story? Yahweh's mercy. Yahweh's natures. Yahweh using a disobedient servant, Yonah, to reach out to people who served many gods out on the seas. And as you said, performing a miracle that could not be ignored, a.k.a. a hurricane right in the middle of the Mediterranean, <clears throat> as we would know it today. And so it's a metaphor of his grace. It's a metaphor of Messiah, Yeshua. So, as you said in the New Testament, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, you have the story of how uh, Yeshua was at the bottom of the boat and his disciples woke him up. Here, you had these men, these sailors who served many gods, finding no no break at all as they served our gods to get them out of the situation they're in. Found Yona, woke him up, questioned him. The other is, although how hard Yona tried to get away from the instructions of Yahweh, Yahweh knows how to get our attention. <laughs> So that way he will proceed with his instructions. And even in the middle of a hurricane where Jonah thought himself to be a goner, yeah. he was saved. Yes. And instead of having a perspective of while being in the belly of the fish three days and three nights, he prayed from a perspective of not only gratitude but also one of salvation and then Yahweh had the fish spit him out so there was here a metaphor a, a picture of what I see the opposite of in modern day we pray why here he's praying thank you mm -hmm. in modern day we pray what's in it for us here he's praying as if he's already received the blessings and the treasures. Yeah. Hmm. And it's, a, it's a different picture of a prayer we're normally accustomed to praying, especially when we're in the flesh and we're praying for what we desire, what we want, what we are hoping for from the work of our hands or the deliverance 
from our enemies, deliverance from calamity, from bill collectors and whatever else we may have you in modern day society. And here he was praying as if no enemies, just love. Love for God, love not for his life, which as far as he was concerned, he acknowledged was in disobedience to Yahweh there at right. that moment. But one of acceptance. And so then Yahweh spit him out, had the fish spit him out, and used him. Let's talk about the um, metaphors of Jonah's repentance. Mm -hmm. And it's interesting how you drew this illustration, if we can bring it up. Oops. Bring my Bible up. Coming. Go ahead and bring the Bible full screen. Can you bring the Bible where it fits the the whole Bible fits in the screen? Okay. So, in modern society, I have seen the so-called drying of the fish on people's vehicles, on people's clothing, and commonly on materials in, in modern-day churches that follow some form or other of Christianity. And um, I never thought of it here. It's a metaphor. Okay, so the metaphors are, first of all, he's taken from Jerusalem, which is the highest of all cities in the spiritual sense. And he gets on a boat. Now, this is his actions, not God's. But God uses everything. You can't wreck God's plans. And so he paid the, the uh, price of the tour to get across the sea to Tarshish so he could get away from Yahweh. And in this story, he went all the way from the highest of the heavens. And that would be like this area here. closest to God and he went on to the boat and in here the little boat's being tossed to and fro with this hurricane and Jonah tells him throw me over if you want to live so they did and God prepared this great fish this big mouth big eyes And the fish came along and swallowed him whole. Didn't chew him up. Didn't spit him out until God told him to. So he went from the highest crowning points of the heavens to the lowest. all the way to the depths of the oceans. And it says in the Hebrew that this is like the pit of Sheol, the pit of the, the grave. And that he went from the ocean level across here. He went down to the bottom of the uh, pit, to the foundations of the, of the earth. And the foundations of the earth is where the, uh, where the uh, seashore was anchored. And it says, as my life was passing away from me, he believed he was going to die. And then he cried out to Yahweh, and Yahweh heard him. Well, he's from the lowest point on earth here, at the very foundations of the earth. And when he cried out to Yahweh, did God say, sorry, can't hear you? 
Nope. He had a repentant heart, and he says, okay, I'll do it. Just get me out of here. <laughs> and so God causes him to spit Jonah up. Well, that was, that was actually what I was getting at, was he didn't actually ask him to get him out of there. His prayer, uh, Jonah's prayer perspective, was the opposite of what we would pray. We would pray, get us out of here. He prayed, thank you, Lord. Mm -hmm. For I was a dead, I was doomed, I was dead. I used all these metaphors to explain his calamity, his distress, his situation, his disobedience, acknowledging those things in a form of gratitude to Yahweh as if he was already delivered in faith that he was already saved. Yep. So that was the perspective I was giving that's different in this metaphor that you rarely see most people are not accustomed to praying as if it already is going to come about their blessings. Mm -hmm. Most people do not pray to any God from a perspective beyond usually what they want, what they need. Help me, help me, help me. Give me, give me, give me. Or curse those that are making me look bad. <laughs> right. Okay, so Jonah then... He is, uh, I guess you could say, the reluctant prophet. Yep. And he wanted to get away from God rather than run to him. And so God takes him captive in a great fish where he can't run anywhere else. And now the fish is going to carry him wherever the fish wants to, and Jonah is helpless with it. Um. So his journey started off on the surface of the ocean. After the hurricane hits, they throw him overboard, and he then is under the waters at the foundations of the earth. And God uh, shows him the end of his life, and then he decides, you know, I better do something. <laughs> no, this isn't going to end very well for me. So, the fish throws him up on the beach over there somewhere or close to Nineveh. And he's got this half-digested piece of seaweed wrapped around his head, it said in the text. And so, here he is. He's got this green seaweed that's, that's from the uh, fish's stomach wrapped around his head almost like a turban and he's standing there on the seashore on the beach and he's walking along and here comes some Ninevites and they see him walking along the beach with this half chewed piece of seaweed uh, on his head half digested clothing and they're looking at him and they're going whoa man look at that I think I've Better get off those drugs. <laughs> so he um, essentially, uh, God is staging a great revival on that ship. And it says that every man on there uh, repented and turned towards Yahweh and cried out to him for salvation. What other... How else could God have ever turned that situation so quickly around to be repentant except that the spirit of evangelism was on Giona and he is now a uh, revival preacher <laughs> and his message was so powerful and impactful that the entire ship repented and turned to God. Right. Really amazing. And then he gets up there on the on the uh, beach over there close to Nineveh, and the Ninevites are out there, and they're sitting there looking at him with his digested clothes and <laughs> seaweed on his head. And they say, wow, man, what's going on with you? And he says, repent. Nineveh is going to be destroyed in 40 days. 
Well, what are you going to do? You're going to repent. Or as the old joke goes, repaint and sin no more. <laughs> so, of course, Jonah goes on into Nineveh, and they're the great city. And they're a whole lot like New York City, I would imagine. And he preached the message of repentance and turning to Yahweh. And, of course, everywhere he went, people were repenting and turning to Yahweh. Even the king ordered that all men and beasts and creatures in the land should fast and not put anything in their mouth except at his word. And they repented and they come back to Yahweh. So all of these things were part of the uh, metaphor of the return. of Jonah's repentance. Huge, huge, huge. There's a lot more in the way of metaphors in the book of Jonah. Uh, the, the story in Hebrew seems to have little loops in it. And uh, sometimes they're in loops of three and sometimes they're in loops of seven. And it's the way Jewish poetry works. Well, that's about what I got. Amen. Anybody else got anything or questions? Okay. Well, let's uh, take a little break then, and we will uh, resume some more of the day of fasting uh, around 2 or th uh, maybe around 3 o'clock. Huh? We were scheduled at five. Scheduled at five, that's fine. Yeah. Okay then.